Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, cameras on, please. So today we are continuing on with substantial economic effect and our last day on this topic. Um, we're going through the examples of the problems on page 150 and 151. Um, so we left off in the middle of problem one. Um, so let's restate the basic facts uh, and then we'll move forward. So we have a very simple set of facts here. Um, we've got A and B. We've got A and B. And A is a general partner, B is a limited partner. They each contribute 100. So these are capital accounts. They buy a building. This is the book value of the building. And we're told we're now on um, the building's going to depreciate $20 per year. The other income and deductions of the partnership will offset. Um, so we'll see that that becomes important later, but basically that net that other stuff nets to zero and whatever other stuff we would have, we would allocate 50, 50, because the only thing we're allocating specially is the depreciation and perhaps the gain chargeback, but everything else is 50, 50. Well, if it's zero, everything else is 50, 50, everything else is zero. We don't have to worry about 50, 50, 50% 50 of zero is zero. So we're just left isolating this depreciation and we're on part D, 1D here, and we're going to assume now that uh, the partnership agreement provides that they're going to maintain capital accounts and that they're going to liquidate according to positive capital account balances. Uh, A has to restore deficit balance in her capital account, but B does not have to restore deficit balance in her capital account. So and the agreement contains the QIO. And so this sets us up for the alternate effect test. Um, and if we just go to year one, so year one, we've got 20 of depreciation. In our approach here, we allocate it according to the partnership agreement, which would go to L to B. We test it for substantial economic effect. Under economic effect, the allocation doesn't satisfy the general test because B doesn't have to restore capital account balances, negative capital account balances, but the alternate effect test is satisfied um, because this does not drive B's capital account below zero. Okay, that's the answer in one in terms of economic effect. Um, any questions on that? Well, then you would test it for substantiality. This economic effect is substantial. And for substantiality, again, we're gonna to need to know the tax attributes of the partners to really evaluate this, but um, we'd, you'd be looking for offsetting allocations. Uh, again, we're comparing this to like a 50-50 sharing ratio, which is the baseline here. And, um, B just gets this depreciation, there's no offsetting allocation or no significant chance of offsetting allocation, then it's gonna uh, have, it's gonna satisfy substantiality. B will be substantially worse off. Um, the capital accounts will be in different places. Um, and so really here, you know, and in most cases you're gonna look for offsetting allocations and there really are none here, even if there's a gain chargeback. So let's assume the facts are all depreciation to B and all recapture gain to be. That's a gain chargeback. Um, conceptually, that gain chargeback is could be offsetting if it exists. If this building is not going down in value, that 20 is gonna come back to, to be in the form of gain. But that's where the value goes basis rule protects this and says, even if 
that's a certainty. Even if we know that with a high degree of confidence that B is going to get charged back that 20, we ignore it. And so it's going to satisfy substantiality. Okay, any questions on that? So this allocation of the agreement is going to be valid for year one. And the same thing is going to be true for years two through five. We can just aggregate those together because it's the same thing. We get to years two through five, we're going to have 80 of depreciation. And again, it's going to be valid for B for the same reason. And again, for the alternate effect test, the significant thing here is the uh, B's capital account is not going below zero. It's right at zero. We're at the precipice, but we haven't crossed it, crossed over. Okay, questions on years two through five? Okay, then we get to year six. Things get interesting in year six. And the agreement, we'd allocate it again to L to, to B under the agreement. Well, now we've got a problem, or at least a potential problem. Again, we're going to ask for B, does this drive B's capital account below zero? The answer is yes. Take it from zero to negative 20. The next question is, is does B have an LDRO, a limited deficit restoration obligation? We know B doesn't have an unlimited deficit restoration obligation. Does he have a limited deficit restoration obligation? So we're going to look for things and we'll look for things like, has he contributed a promissory note to the partnership? Is he required to make a future capital contribution to the partnership? Um, and the answer there is no. And so he has no LDRO. So this allocation lacks economic effect under the alternate test and the general test. And so it's invalidated. And now we have to reallocate in accordance with PIP. So we reallocate in accordance with PIP. And this is where that special PIP rule comes into play. I'll, I'll cite it here. We're not going to look at it again now, but it's 1.702-1B3, three little i's. And it says we can, at least leaving aside substantiality, which is not an issue here, we can figure out where this missing allocation goes. And what we're going to do is we're going to hypothesize a liquidation for book value at the end of year five and a uh, liquidation at book value at the end of year six. And we're going to compare the economic results for these hypothetical liquidations. So what if the partnership were to liquidate at the end of year five for book value? Well, there would be a hundred of cash. We'd sell the building for a hundred. That's what the book value is. And the cash would go a hundred to A, because that's A's capital account, and zero to B, because that's B's capital account in the year five. We liquidate according to positive capital account balances, goes a hundred and zero. So end year five, A walks away with 100, and B walks away with zero. Everybody see that? Any questions about that hypothetical liquidation at the end of year five? Okay, we compare that with end year six. Well, now we only have 80 to distribute. And where does it go? I mean, the books of the partnership look would look like a hundred and negative twenty. <clears throat> so we know the 80 is going to go to A. Is A going to get any more? And the answer is no. Uh, a is not going to get any more. B, you know, looks like he has a capital account that's negative, but B is not obligated to restore. And there's nothing else under the partnership agreement or under state law that would require B to kick in that money. So at the end of year six, A is going to walk away with 80 and B is going to walk away with zero. And by comparing these two amounts, these 
two sets of amounts. That tells us where the missing allocation goes, and it very clearly goes to A. A is the one who bears the economic burden of this 20 of depreciation, not B. So the answer in year six is that even though the partnership agreement says to allocate that 20 of depreciation to B, it ends up getting reallocated to A. So A reports that 20 of depreciation in her own tax return, not B. Okay. Questions on year six? So let me just say one other thing. So in, in, many, in many cases in the real world, what a partnership agreement will say, it'll say something like this. It'll say all depreciation to B, however, no allocation to B that would drive B's capital count below any LDRO. And you know all you know, and then reallocate to A. So in other words, the partnership agreement will have like a fail safe, where it won't fail the economic effect. It basically incorporates economic effect and in how it's and how they go. And um, there's reasons for that that we'll talk about later. But basically, the drafters don't want to draft something that's going to fail. And so that's if that were the case, then we would uh, under the agreement this gets reallocated to A under the agreement. I mean, it's the same practical result, but instead of the agreement sort of failing and not being respected and reallocating under PIP, we are just having the agreement say, normally it would go here, but because it would drive B below zero, let's not allocate it there, let's allocate it somewhere else. Okay. Questions? Let me stop. Any questions on any of this? All right. Well, then we go to we go to um, E. So E is same facts, but now B has contributed her own promissory note of 100. So she has written a promissory note, contributed to the partnership. So the issue here is, is that an LDRO? Because in year six, here, it would take B to negative 120. I'm sorry, negative 20. Which is okay. Um, if the if the pro pro promissory note supports an LDRO of 100, the face value. And so let's take a look at the regulation. In fact, this, this is okay. This will be supported. This is 1.704-1B2, uh, two little i's C. Let's turn there. Let's turn to that regulation. The thing is obligation or restored deficit. And it says certain obligations are treated as a deficit restoration obligation, a limited deficit restoration obligation. And says the outstanding amount, which is the balance of any promissory note, contributed by a partner. There's a carve out for promissory notes that are readily tradable on an established securities market. That would be extremely rare. So we don't have to worry about that. 
Um, and so this supports B to go down to negative 100. And he's only at negative 20. So this allocation will have economic effect on the alternate test. OK, questions on that? All right, one loose end, we've covered that before. Again, there's an example in the regs. I think it was example one, like 10 little nine, not nine or 10 little eyes, something like that. Um, so we've done this before. I, one loose end here, somebody might say, well, wait, we contribute a promissory note. Shouldn't that increase our capital account? Um, so let's look at the capital account rules here. Dash one, B two, four little eyes. Dash one, B two, four little eyes. Just a few pages ahead, five pages ahead. Remember, this is these are our capital account rules. We spent a lot of time in B, the general basic rules. So the capital account goes up by the amount of money you can do with the fair market value of property contributed by him to the partnership. Was a promissory note property? Is your promissory note property? It's funny in the tax law, that's kind of an interesting question. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Certainly someone else's promissory note is property um, to you. Uh, your promissory note is not really your property, it's just an obligation. Um, so, but if we just stop there, we might say, well, maybe B gets capital account credit for that promissory note when he contributed it, in which case his, his capital account is actually 200, not 100, right? He contributed 100 cash and a promissory note of 100. But down below in D, D2, there's this rule. that says generally the promissory note is contributed by a partnership to a partner who is the maker of such note, such partner's capital account is increased only when there is a taxable disposition of the note or when the partner makes principal payments on such a note. So that means you ignore the, the partner, the promissory note, the partnership just has a promissory note. The partner's capital account, the contributing partner's capital account will be increased generally when the partner starts to make principal payments on the note when he satisfies the note. So it's treated, part, the promissory note is treated for capital account purposes like a delayed capital contribution. We'll deal with it, we'll treat it as a capital contribution when payments are made on the note. Or if the partnership disposes of the note to a third party, the partnership could sell the note, say, hi, I have this really valuable note by B, I'll sell it to this third party at that point, it springs into being like real property because no longer sort of between these two part uh, taxpayers. But the typical thing would be just awaiting payment on the note. Okay, so all that together says that the books of the partnership are gonna look like this. Again, we didn't include the promissory note here we're not going to put the promissory note on the balance sheet. We're going to sort of ignore it until it gets principal payments are made. So it doesn't increase B's capital account, but it does allow B's capital account to go down to negative 100. Okay, so the answer in E is the big difference. The difference between D is that the allocation of 20 depreciation to B in year six is going to be respected. Questions? All right, does this make sense? Again, we don't need to do this because it, we the allocation is respected, but again, we can use that approach of a hypothetical liquidation end year five. We already did that before. We knew that A got 100 and B B will end up getting zero. So what will happen with B at the end of year five is B's capital account starts at zero. Well, when the interest is liquidated, he's got to pay his note. So he's going to put in a hundred. 
that'll increase this cap account back up to 100 and then it'll get back the $100 he just put in. So B's net distribution is gonna be zero. He's gonna get 100, but he's gonna also have to put in 100. So he nets to zero. Right, he, he, contrib he satisfies the note, puts 100 of cash here, increases cap account to 100, get back there, 100. GP gets his 100, you know, and you can conceptualize it as that 100 if you want. Okay, so B's net distribution at the end of year five is zero. Does that make sense? You go to end year six, what happens now? Well, now B's cap account is negative 20. Now they're going to liquidate. They're going to sell this building for 80. Uh, B is going to have to kick in, contribute his cash on the promissory note. So that's his contribution. So he's going to have a capital account of 80. And A is going to have a capital account of 100. The partnership is going to have 180 of cash. 80 from the sale of the building, 100 from the contribution of the note. And so the 180 of cash is going to go 100 to A and 80 to B. So A is going to get 100 at the end of year six. B is going to get 80 from the liquidating distribution, but he's going to have to kick in 100. So he's going to get 80 minus 100. He's going to get negative 20. Right, he's getting 100 at the end, but right before the end, he's got to put in his 100. Uh, sorry, he's getting 80 at the end, the very end. But he had to put in 100 to get the 80. So you put in 100 to get 80, you're losing 20. So comparing the two, we see that A is in the same place and B has suffered by 20. And that make, that's what makes this make sense. This actually harms B. We didn't have to do that part here because it wasn't necessary, but just to show you the concept, to show you that it makes sense, you can, you can do that. That's what's supposed to happen. This is all, the tax is supposed to match the economics. Okay, questions? All right. So now we're going to F. So in F, what changes here? We're in we're in year six again. We're in year six. We've got 20 of depreciation. We're tentatively allocating it to B, testing it for financial economic effect, We're applying economic effect. And the difference here in year six is at, at the end of each of these years, under the alternate test, we're gonna crystal ball it and say, okay, are we gonna, we foreseeing any future distributions to B that are not going to be matched by capital account increases. So again, we're not worried about distributions of profits because profits are going to increase B's capital account. And the distributions will take it back down. It's only to the extent B is going to get a net reduction in his capital account because of a distribution. And the classic issues here are going to be distributions of borrowing proceeds. Because when you borrow, there's no increase in capital account when you borrow money. So presumably we crystal balled it at the end of years one through five and didn't foresee anything. When year six, or any, we didn't see anything that was problematic. In year six, we look forward and we say, you know what? In year seven, we're going to borrow 
$200,000 and distribute that $200,000 50-50. So what is what impact does this have? And so this is getting at this anticipation of this these distributions. We're going to turn to that one B two two little i's D. That's the alternate effect test. And six. We're going to turn there. Dash one B two two little i's D six. effect test and right here we have to it, in determining the extent to which the previous sense is satisfied we have to adjust the capital count for these items again four and five are not relevant to this class six distributions that are reasonably expected to be made to the extent they exceed the offsetting increases. So that describes this distribution. And so what we're going to do is purposes of seeing how low B can go. We're going to pull forward this distribution. Again, not we're not really doing that. We're not going to, we're not we're not really adjusting B's capital account. I'll put this in, in red. Because we're not actually, this is not going to show up on the capital account, but this is going to be what we're doing the, for purposes of seeing how low B can go. This is our distribution. Year seven. We're pulling that forward. And now we can see this. And now this would take this, this is our year six depreciation. This would take us to negative 120. And B's LDRO is negative is 100, because that's the promissory note. So this allocation drives B below is LDRO to its entirety, and so it gets has to get reallocated under PIP. It's going to get reallocated to A. Okay, so we pulled this forward, and again, what we're doing is we're going to leave B a cushion. So that when that year seven distribution happens, it's not going to create a code red situation where B's capital account is in funny money territory. Okay, any questions about how we pulled this forward for first seeing what B's capital account is for this purpose? Um, okay, what about the PIP? This gets a little bit confusing. Again, how we're going to PIP, we're going to do the year, year five hypothetical liquidation, then we do the year six hypothetical liquidation. Um, so we go to year six. Um, And in year six, we're going to have uh, this is 80 here. And uh, A is going to get, uh, so uh, 
try to figure think about the best way to explain this. So we have to year six, we've got this 80. We also have to uh, pull forward this distribution. Um, and so what's going to happen here, and we also have debt here. And so what's going to happen here is that A is going to get 100 cash out because we're going to pull forward that distribution. Let me just show you where that comes from. In the rag. We're going to go take a quick look at dash one B three, three little eyes, that special pip rule. So this is what tells us that we compare the end year five with the end year six. And then it has this language we have to adjust for the result of items in four, five, and six. So that tells us we have to account for that loan distribution in making this analysis. That's what gets this tricky here. We got to adjust for that. So we basically what that's saying is basically pull forward that distribution as if it happened in year six. So A is going to get 100 of distribution. Um, and then from the loan. Uh, B is going to, again, kick in the 100. Um, That's the note. And then that's going to take B's capital account uh, up to. You know what? Let me uh, come back to this. This is hard to do on the fly. I, I didn't focus on this in my notes. So let me come back to it. Again, uh, I'll, I'll uh, do something with this later. But the point here is that what I, re I really want you to know is just that pulling this forward, this allocation to B is invalid um, and it gets reallocated under PIP. And I'm gonna think about the best way to explain it here because I didn't do it in my notes and I, on the fly is not gonna work, okay? Um, so hold off on that PIP stuff for this, but um, really the core part of this problem is to show that we've pulled this forward. Um, and if you want an example that's just like this problem, uh, we saw it, it's 1.704-1B5, example six little eyes. So this is a very similar version of that problem. Okay, well, let's move to, to part G. So G is a similar fact pattern where, where again, we're dealing with we're dealing with year six. And we would give the depreciation to B. But now the crystal ball, again, we look and we say, okay, there are going to be these, you know, this distribution to B that requires us to build in this cushion. And, you know, the facts are, it's not clear. Um, unlike in F, where we had sort of a certainty, we're going to do this next year. 
now we have this uncertainty, I guess, where, you know, the bank has said, you know, we'll make this loan, but we have to have this much equity in it for you to make it. And so if the building goes up in value sufficiently, then we will borrow, but uh, it's contingent. And, may, you know, how likely is it that the building, which is now worth 300, is going to be worth 400 soon, I guess, you know, because it doesn't have to happen in year seven. It can you know, when the bill, if and when the building appreciates by 33%, then we'll borrow. And who knows when that'll happen. So that seems to me to be too speculative. It's not reasonably expected uh, as uh, the, the reg would require. And so it seems to me like we wouldn't have to pull that forward. It's too contingent. And so if we didn't have to pull it forward, then year six allocation would be valid, right? Um, because it only takes B to negative one, negative 20, and B has that LDRO of 100, okay? So if it seems sufficiently contingent, we didn't have to pull it forward, then we don't, right? Does that make sense? But then the question is, well, what happens if then, you know, lo and behold, the following year, you know, the building increases in value, they borrow and distribute. So in year seven, what happened? They go and they take this 200 of cash here and they distribute 100 and 100. distributions reduce capital account balances. So now after the distribution, B's capital account is negative 120, A's capital account is zero. Well, this should cause some concern because we know B's LDRO is only 100. Now he's got a capital account of negative 120. So he's below his LDRO. It's in the funny money territory. And this is what triggers the QIO. Let's look at the QIO language, qualified income offset. Dash one B2 for the lies D. Turn to that right one. Dash one B2, I'm sorry, that dash one B2 two little lies D. What's a QIO? It's this sentence right here. So we didn't build up the capital. I'm going to create the cushion because it wasn't, you know, expected enough. It wasn't reasonably expected. So the QIO in the agreement provides that a partner who unexpectedly receives a distribution in six will be allocated items of income and gain consisting of a pro rata portion of each item of partnership income, including gross income and gain, in an amount and manner sufficient to eliminate such deficit balance as quickly as possible. So when we have the code red situation, where we've gone below our LDRO because of this unexpected distribution, we now have to allocate to B $20 of income as quickly as possible to get B back up to negative 100. And so we know we have here, we have this depreciation each year. We're also told the partnership has gross income and deductions, uh, but they offset. So we haven't, we haven't had to consider them before. So we don't know how much there are, but let's just say, let's assume there's a hundred of gross income and a hundred of other deductions, right? But these cancel out. So before we never had to really worry about that. Could have been a billion of gross income and a billion of other deductions, it didn't matter. Well, now it matters because the QIO is gonna say, okay, get B 20 of gross income right away. Oh, 
not a zero, it's a QIO. So that's what the QIO is going to do. So they give V off the top this 20, regardless of whatever else the partnership agreement says. So that's what the QIO does. And then after the QIO, V is at negative 100, which is okay, because that's supported by the promissory note. Now, what do we have left? Well, we've already, we've allocated 80 of the, I'm uh, sorry, 20 of the gross income, so we have 80 left. So we have 20 of depreciation and then 20 of net loss from the remaining items. And we know that that's going to go to A because B can't go below negative 100. I mean, the agreement's going to say this goes to B and the rest is split 50-50. But we know once you get to a QIO situation, you can't, B's capital account can't go negative. And so that's what's going to end up happening. So the most important thing here, what I want folks to understand is again, how the QIO works again. The previous problem, we got in front of the problem and we left enough cushion so that the year seven distribution would only take B to negative 100. In this problem, we had a lack of foresight. We couldn't reasonably expect what was gonna happen. And so we're fixing it up on the back end by getting B 20 of gross income as quickly as possible. What if the partnership only had 10 of gross income and 10 of other deductions? Well, the QIO would then only give them 10. We, uh, the QIO says we're going to give them gross income uh, as, uh, in order to, to get them back up to the LDRO amount, but we're only going to give them what we got. We're not going to invent uh, whole cloth gross income. So if it's insufficient, we'll give them all of it, and then we'll go to the next year. And we'll try to clean you know, up until we get them back up to the LDRO amount. But as long as we have more than 20 of gross income, or at least 20 of gross income, then we can fully get there in year seven. Okay. And I'll, again, the PIP stuff here, which is really getting this stuff over here, I'm going to decide how much I want to go over that because that gets particularly confusing because we got this note here and it may not be worth our time, but in any event, I'll clean up uh, that a little bit another time. Okay, questions on problem one. I have a question and yep. maybe just a concept I'm not understanding as well, but so the gross income is not acting as a distribution. It's acting to increase the capital account. Yeah, no, these are tax items. So again, let's keep track. It's easy to, to lose track of that. And, uh, you know, these are tax items. These are items of, this, this is a depreciation deduction. This is gross income. These are other deductions like maintenance, expenses, and salaries and the like. And so, yeah, we're, this, this, is, this is just giving him gross income. He's going to have to report down on his tax return. Um, and that's just, again, the way to get his capital account up. And so, um, because once it's down here, it's just ridiculous. It's absurd, right? And so let's get it back to a situation where it makes sense. So we've allocated him. And so he's going to report on his tax return, 20 of gross income. And A is going to report 40 of deductions. That's a lot different than the way the partnership agreements, the partnership agreement would suggest he gets 20 of deduction and A gets zero. So it's totally flipped around on its head what's happened. And that's because we've gotten B into this code red situation. It's, it's cleaning up the mess. It's two wrongs make a right. That's why I said, you know, going back, it, it, that's why they have the reasonably expected. It sure would be nice to get out in front of the problem and not have to get into this ridiculousness here. Um, let's just um, prevent it. Let's stop it here. But the reg writers also knew we can't predict everything that's going to happen in this world. If we could, you know, 
uh, that would be nice to predict everything, but we know we can't do that. And so we have to have a mechanism to clean it up at the end. You could also say, well, you can't make distributions that would drop you below to this. And partnership agreements could say that. Partnership agreements could say, look, here's how we're gonna distribute, but we're not gonna distribute anybody that gets below an LDRO to avoid getting into this stuff. But in the absence that, you know, the tax law won't, doesn't prevent the distribution. So distribution happens, capital account is now here, and now let's clean it up. And that's what the QIO does. And it's just tax, it's just tax. Okay, other questions? All right, well, let's go to problem two, which is a substantiality problem, a little bit less technical here. Um, so we've got a problem here where we've got C and D. And they're equal partners in all respects. You know, they, they, we could, this could be an amendment of the partnership. They're equal, or, or maybe they've contributed everything 50 50. Um, C, D is a foreigner a non-US person, C is a US person. Under US tax law, non-US people only pay tax on their US source income. US persons pay tax on all their worldwide income. In general, things are always more complicated when you get down to the weeds, but that's the general approach. And this partnership has both U.S. and foreign source income. And so what they're going to do is they're going to allocate all of the U.S. source income here and all of the foreign source here. So that's what they're going to do. And they're going to maintain capital accounts, liquidate according to positive capital account balances, restore negative capital accounts. So this is the big three is met. This is a, a, a substantiality problem and that's it. And uh, the question is, does this work? Does this allocation scheme work? And we're going to compare to the baseline. The baseline, again, is 50-50. The baseline, we'll put in brackets, would be 50% of the US, 50% of the foreign, and 50-50 here as well. And the key part of A you know, is this language in the example it says cannot be predicted. The relative dollar amounts cannot be predicted. Who knows what's going to happen? Well, if that's true, if it's as uncertain as, you know, who's going to win the NCAA basketball championship this year? then this is going to pass muster on the substantiality. And we can go through the tests. The overall tax effects test asks, is it possible, reasonable possibility that anyone will lose in a substantial way? Well, yeah, if you're giving up, if you're going from 50-50 of each type to all of one type and none of the other type, and the relative amounts cannot be predicted, you could have huge amounts of US and low amounts of foreign or vice versa. Somebody can lose from this bet. And likewise, the capital accounts are, could end up wildly different if there's this possible variation, variance, huge variance between the two amounts. So this, this is going to work. And there's enough risk here that someone's going to lose out that 
even if it gives a tax benefit and you see what the tax game here, the tax game is basically D doesn't want US source income because that's what D pays US tax on. C doesn't care about the source, but D does. But this will work again, I'm in assuming that cannot be predicted. It's a crapshoot. If it's such a crapshoot, someone could lose from this bet. This is a risky bet. Okay, so that's A. B is easy, then it doesn't work. So what B says is, okay, we're gonna still do 50-50. We'll still do 50-50, but um, you're, you're gonna fill up C's capital account with US source as much as possible and D's capital account with foreign source as much as possible. And, but it's always gonna be even, you know, we're gonna spill over to the extent we have to get to 50-50. And so for example, let's say there is uh, 550 of foreign and 450 of the US. Well, they're each gonna get the 500. They're gonna split that 1,000 each way. We're gonna give foreigner 500. We're gonna give US, all the US. And then we're going to make up the difference here. And again, we compare that to the baseline, which would have been just 50-50 of everything. So it would have been 275. Well, this is a classic shifting problem because the capital accounts are always going to end up in exactly the same place. That's mathematically the case. It's gonna always end up being 50-50 overall. We're just changing what it's comprised of. And that's classic shifting. So shifting asks, the capital counts end up in the same place at, at the end of the taxable year? One, and then two, at or near the same place. And two, did the partner's tax liability go down in the aggregate? And so this is pretty easy. Uh, this is taxable in the U.S. and this is not. And this is taxable in the U.S. as well as this. And this is not. So from C's tax liability is the same. D's now taxed under the baseline on quite a bit of income. And so, yes, see that the party's collective tax liability went down. So this is a shifting problem and it doesn't work. It fails the shifting test. It also fails the overall tax effects test because no partner is worse off. C is, no, C is in the same place and D is better off after tax. Same capital account, but avoiding a bunch of US tax. So it fails both. And we have to reallocate under PIP. And this reallocation is really simple because we ended up in the same capital accounts. Uh, it's 50 50, so we would reallocate this. We said it, it, um, that. The baseline and the reallocation is not necessarily the same, and he, but here it is um, because the capital accounts um, are equal, exactly equal. Therefore, we just split everything 50-50. We'll see where that gets a little bit, where that's more complicated. But here the baseline would also be the reallocation. And so this would be how 
things get reallocated. Okay, questions on B? So B is just like classic shifting problem. I mean, you, all you've done, the capital accounts are the same and you've just changed what they're comprised of. That's just easy stuff, easy substantiality problem. Um, C is a little bit more ambiguous because in C, we're going to again allocate back to like an A, we're going to allocate all the foreign, all the US to C, all the foreign to D. But now instead of cannot be predicted, now the relative amounts are going to be roughly, the, the amounts are going to be roughly equal. This puts a lot of weight on roughly. Um, and we, this is where again, like we would need to do a range like we have with example five in the regulations where we're told the range. Let's just assume here that roughly equal means between 490 and 510 of foreign and between 490 and 510 of US. Well, if that's the case, that's not a whole lot of variability. And the baseline here, let me clean this up. So under the baseline, four ninety. Two forty-five. Well, I guess the way to do this is um, let's look at like uh, a worst case scenario for um, you know, C is the U.S. So let's say the foreign income is the greatest. So the foreign income is five ten, and the U.S. income is four ninety. So under the baseline, we would switch, we would, we would give 50% of each. And so it's going to be 245 and 245. I reverse that. Whatever. It's 490 of foreign, 510 of US. That's worst case for uh, for D, the foreigner. And then with the special allocations, we give all the foreign here and all the US there. So now we test that. We see. So there's your maximum capital account variance is going to be 10. So your capital accounts are not going to be very far off. That gets into this question of whether it's substantially different. And the tax liability again is going to go way down because under the baseline, all of this is subject to US tax, whereas only this is subject to US tax with special allocation. So capital accounts are pretty close, and the uh the uh <clears throat> Tax liability has gone uh, way down. And you'll see it's the same thing for if you flip it around. And on the overall tax effects test, uh, nobody is worse off. Uh, C has 510 higher capital account. Um, so C is better off. D is worse off pre-tax, but better off after tax because he's avoided all of this. So you can again run those permutations, but again, the idea here is that as the variance between the two shrinks, the potential variance shrinks, 
you get in a situation where no one's going to be substantially worse off or the capital accounts won't substantially differ and clearly the overall tax the uh, at the the uh, tax liability of the partners is going down because again you're shifting lots of this uh income away from d so, so i have here, a question yeah um yeah. am i oversimplifying if i just use a hundred dollars and i don't do the range of 490 to 510 i'll get the same well, answer, be right? equal. i mean if they're going to be equal if they are actually going to be equal exactly equal well then it's easy then of course then we're back to b if they're exactly equal it's the same as b where the capital accounts are going to be the same regardless and you're just changing what's comprised of the problem that this this part of the problem creates is that uncertainty and it's kind of get you you don't we don't know the answer that we need to know more about what roughly means and as that variance goes up this will work you know if roughly means again 490 to 510 of each that's not going to work. If roughly means 300 to 700 of each, and it could be 700 of one and 300 of the other, is that roughly equal? I don't, you know, I don't know what that means. I wouldn't give you an exam or expect you to do more than an exam if I were to give you something exactly like this to sort of say, we need to know what roughly means more. Um, again, if I needed, a, if I wanted you to give me an answer, I'd have to give you some some, some permutations like we did in example five of the regs, so you can run some numbers. Um, which is what we've done here a little bit, but, um, anyway, let's assume any other questions. Let's assume roughly is small. And so therefore this doesn't work. What if this is what actually happens? This gets back to the reallocation. So we tested based on this 50, 50, but then what actually happens is we do have this small variance. So this is how we reallocate under PIP when we have a substantiality failure. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, D, you're getting 490 out of a total 1,000. You're getting 49%. And so we give 49% of the foreign to D and 49% of the U.S. to D. So the reallocation would be 49%. Do the math. 0.49 times 490. So D would get 240 and 49% of 510, 250. And C would get 250 and 240. I'm sorry, uh, two, 260. So that's that reallocation. Again, that's 1.704-1B5, example five, two little i's. So we do have a reallocation under PIP. We don't change the bottom line capital accounts. We change what they're comprised of and we prorate the different items. That's what's confusing. You would think, one might think that you would reallocate and just give 50-50, but we're not gonna change the actual capital accounts. So. If this is what were to actually happen and we lack substantiality, then this is a reallocation. If there's enough wiggle room, if there's enough variance, then this could work, right? If this is, if it could have been 300, 700, but it was 495, 10, they got lucky in that short effect, then, then uh, that would be respected as this. But if it were tight enough that there were no chance of significant loss, then the reallocation would be in these ways. Okay. The other the one last thing I'll say is that let's say this is what actually happens. And we're again, we're testing for substantiality. Under the shifting test, the issue is the capital accounts are close enough. That's the issue. The tax liability going down is without question. Uh, the really issue is going to be the capital accounts. Are they substantially the same? And if they are, this is where that hindsight presumption comes into play. Because if it happens to be like this, the burden of proof is going to be on the taxpayer to show it's a rebuttal presumption 
that this was strongly likely to happen. So instead of the IRS having the burden to show that uh, the variance was going to be small and um, the taxpayer is going to have to show, prove the variance was big, even though it turned out not to be big, right? The potential variance was large, even though the ex post variance turned out to be small. Right. It's like uh, when the Bucks won the Super Bowl, they'd have to show that the Bucks weren't strongly likely to win the Super Bowl, even though they in fact did. Right. And that's, you can do that, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, if you go back to like Vegas odds, for example, on the Bucks winning the Super Bowl throughout the year, um, it wasn't nearly a slam dunk that they would win, right? They weren't even, they were this, they were a wild card team. So anyway, I don't wanna to get too much into the NFL, but that's the idea of, of this. And, um, but uh, there's just not enough here with roughly to really, I need to know, you need to know a lot more about what roughly means. This could work uh, depending on what that roughly equal implies about variance. Okay. Other questions? All right, then the last one here. So this is a pretty common situation. We got sort of, we can call it like a money and brains partnership. So somebody's got the money, somebody's got the idea. They're gonna come together and try to make something happen. And typically what's gonna happen here is that the money guy, the money person, is going to get allocated the early losses. It's his or her money that's funding these losses, right? They're paying employees and other costs of R&D. So they'll get all the losses. Um, and the brains person usually doesn't put in anything or much. And so uh, there's not there and they, the, the other person can't even get allocated the losses because there's nothing to support it. Um, there's not going to be a deficit restoration obligation. And so it inevitably is going to go to the money person. Then the partnerships hopefully going to start to make money, at least on an annual basis. So early years you lose money that all those losses get allocated to the money person. Then eventually you start to make some money on an annual basis. And all those gains will get allocated, all that income will be allocated to the money person. At some point, hopefully, you're going to uh, become profitable on an overall basis. So your income in the later years is e becomes equal to the losses in the early years, and you're now in the black. And once you reach in the black, then you're going to flip to a different sharing ratio. And so let's say 50-50. So that could be the deal. Uh, all of the early losses to here is E, the money partner. All of the later income to the money partner until the point where the partnership has realized equal amounts of income and loss. So where until the partnership is in the black. And after that point, everything allocated 50-50. And if it all works out, it kind of looks like a transitory problem or at least a potentially transitory problem. So let's just assume, let's say in year one, they lose a thousand. In year two, they lose 500. In year three, they earn 500, year four, they earn 1,000, year five, they earn 2,000. So with this special allocation,
you'd allocate all the losses to E. And then all the income to E. And then at the end of year four, they've hit, they're right on the cusp of in the black. So in year five, it gets split 50-50. So the capital accounts at the end of year five are 1,000 each, leaving aside the capital account adjustments, right? Leaving aside things like capital accounts, uh, you know, contributions and all that. Their capital accounts each go up by 1,000. So that's with the special allocations. The baseline Is 50 could be 50 50 right that you are dividing everything 50 50 and if you did it that way behold, you end up in the same place. So if that's the case, you have the transitory test. You're going to ask what tax liabilities go down in the aggregate. Also ask overall tax effects test, is anybody worse off? And um, you have that. Now, the question here is, again, it's a question of risk and the variance of outcomes. If you know for sure that you are going to end up in the black, then you definitely would have to um, know a lot more. You have to apply the substantiality test. The capital accounts are going to end up, will end up in the same place. So you have to see whether the tax liability goes down. That's on one end of the spectrum. So again, you have like here, which is like certainty. And could you have certainty? I mean, you could. I mean, in the old days, there were like leasing businesses. You know, you could buy, this is buying and leasing a computer. So you buy a computer and you lease it to a high quality lessee. you pretty much know what's going to happen. And so you can run these spreadsheets and you know, you don't, you know, you know, with certainty. So that's on the one end. And the other end of the spectrum, you have something like Uber or whatever, like you like this is Uber, you're starting Uber and who knows what's going to happen. And the way to think about this is it's quite possible that, you know, at the end of year two, they just say, this isn't working. We lost, you know, uh, 90% whatever Silicon Valley startups fail, something like that. If you stop the music at the end of year two, well, now the capital accounts look a lot different. Now E has eaten the entire loss instead of the loss being split between E and F. And so that's the big question here. And to the extent there's a real business, it's a real startup, then the variance is gonna be huge potential variance is going to be huge. And yeah, sure, they may end up being profitable, but there are a lot of other things that could have happened. Um, on the other hand, if it's sort of um, a, a, a not, not a real business, but a leasing type or financing arrangement where the variance is much smaller, then you could run into this problem where it could be uh, transitory. So um, we've run out of time. Uh, take a look at those examples. Uh, example two, and three, let's focus on three that's cited at the end of that problem. We'll finish this up next class. Um, but example three is the most analogous here. And the bottom line is that this should work, um, again, assuming that there's real risk. It, you know, what's the likelihood that this enterprise will not be profitable on an overall basis? If that risk is sufficiently large, then this is gonna work.
and again, in a, in a real business context, real startup context, that risk is, is quite significant. And so no one really bats an eye about this type of what they call a flip arrangement, where it's, it's you're sharing income, uh, lo early loss and income one way. And then once you reach profitability, you're flipping to another sharing ratio. If the likelihood of the flip is uncertain, then that's going to allow it to pass muster. Okay, so we'll continue on with this a few minutes next class, but then we're moving on to the next topic, which deals with non-recourse.